Bless the Lord, brothers and sisters. <clears throat> I bring you greetings from Sound Doctrine Deliverance Ministries out here in Emporia, Virginia. Um, I was not going to do this today. It's been a trying day. But it's not about me. Amen. Um, I'm not going to be with you long. This is just something that the Lord has given me that I want to share with you. And it's just, it's five flawless fundamentals of faith. And they never fail. But you have to apply them to your life. If you look in the 37th division of Psalms, it's five verses that is a fundamental seed you need to plant in your life so that your life is enhanced, so that um, your interactions with other people are enhanced, so that your relationship with God is enhanced. And it's amazing that we look at so much of the word and we, we, we don't really realize that it applies to us right now. Or we don't know how to apply it to ourselves today. But these five, these five fundamentals right here, I promise you, if you apply them to your life, you're going to see an increase in peace. You're going to see an increase in understanding. You're going to see an increase in love. You're going to see an increase in joy. And, and it's so rewarding when you realize that the very God that we love, the very God that we serve, is still in the blessing business. It's not always about finances. How many times when you go to church or you go to, to somebody else's church and it's testimony service and the only thing you hear about is money? Money, 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 money. God is so much greater than money. The blessings that he give us are so much greater than money. But if you apply these fundamentals in Psalm 37, and write these down, even if you don't have your Bible, don't write them down, read them for yourself, pray over them, and apply them. But in the 37th Psalm, and I'm not going to read the whole Psalm, I'm just going to pull out these verses. When you get to verse 3, trust in the Lord, and do good. So shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. The very first part, trust in the Lord. Now, that word trust in its proper definition is defined as having unwavering confidence in God that he's going to supply all of your needs. That's what trust means in this passage. Having unwavering confidence in God that he's going to supply all of your needs. And this is where, if we're honest, a lot of us struggle. Because we know what God said in his word about his promises, and we know what he said about supplying all of our needs, and we know what he said about asking it shall be given, seeking you shall find, knocking the doors be open. We read all of these things. We read when he says, anything you ask in my name, I shall give you. We read these. And then we pray about something. We pray about a financial issue. We pray about a medical issue. We pray about something. And we never seem to receive an answer to our prayer. And we get frustrated, if we're being honest. We get frustrated. We get upset. Is God listening? Do he care? Do he love me? Why is it that I see the wicked prospering and I'm still struggling? Why is it that I'm doing this and I'm doing that, but I never seem to get my breakthrough? It's during these times that you have to learn how to trust in the Lord. Now, I'm not one of those ministers that's going to give you a whole bunch of cliches. I hate cliches, especially in church. So the one thing you will never hear me say is he may not come when you want him, but he always right on time. That's some garbage. Where is he coming from if he said he'll never leave you or forsake you? 
He's there. But our problem is we focus more on the problem instead of having trust in the solution. God is the solution to every problem. Now we're going to go through situations. Do not listen to preachers who tell you you're not going to go through anything. When you accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you signed up for trials and tribulations. You signed up for hardships. But that's where your faith comes into play. Do you trust God enough to not look at your circumstances, but look at his solution? I still struggle with it. I struggle with it. When certain things come up, especially unexpectedly, I struggle with trusting and believing God is going to work it out. But he has never failed. So you have to have that unwavering confidence that God is going to supply all of your needs. Notice I didn't say wants. There's a difference between a want and a need. Now, God will give us some of the things that we want, but he promised to supply all of our needs according to his riches and glory. So the first fundamental is trust in the Lord. When you look at Psalm 37, 4, delight thyself also in the Lord and he shall give thee the desires of thy heart. <clears throat> now, the key word in this verse is delight. And what delight means is remove yourself completely and surrender. Become soft and pliable. Be something that easily being so that God can shape you and mold you. That's delighting yourself in the Lord. Remove yourself. How do you remove yourself? You have to learn how to get. You have to learn how to get out of your own way. It's hard for God to do the things God want to do when you consistently have your hand in the mix. You have to learn how to step back and say, Father, I don't understand what's going on. I don't understand why people are acting this way. I don't understand some of the things that's being said. But Lord, I trust you. Whatever direction you're going to lead me in, I'll go. Whatever it is that you'll have me to do, I'll do. Anything you'll have me to say, I'll say. But watch this. It's also saying, Father, if you would have me to sit here, and do absolutely nothing. I take pleasure in doing nothing. Because we have to always be mindful. Everything that we're doing, we're doing is unto God. Some people have the misconception that you're supposed to do things to please your pastor or please your this or please your that. You do everything to please God. Because if God is pleased, no other report matters. So delighting ourselves in the Lord, we're removing, we're removing ourselves from the process and allowing God to do what only God can do. It goes back to the first step. We're trusting God. And it's not always easy, but it's necessary if we want that peace. What did he say right after that? He said, and do good. Now, what does doing good mean? Doing good simply means pleasing God when no one is watching. Doing what you know to be right according to your spirit, according to scripture, when there's no one there to pat you on your back. I say this, and I, I, I meant this. A lot of people think you can only minister and do good when you're in a pulpit. But understand, true ministry has nothing to do with the pulpit. You will read scripture where Jesus was teaching. And he was teaching a multitude of people. And as soon as he got finished teaching and started walking amongst the people, people started coming to Jesus with their own personal problems. And he was healing. And he was, that's True ministry. When all the preaching is done, that's real ministry. That's where you do good. Because anybody can get in the pulpit and talk a good game. 
But when it's time to put actions to your word and nobody is around to see it, when it's time to start doing the work of God and there's no offering plate to go around, when it's time to start spending time talking to people and consoling people and they don't have anything to give you, you're doing it because you love the Lord. That's doing good. And if we're being honest with ourselves today, brothers and sisters, it's a lot of that missing in the church of God today. It's too much going on with ulterior motives. But we are supposed to delight ourselves in the Lord and do good. Father, what is it that you require of me? Holy Spirit, give me the strength and the wisdom to do it according to your pleasure. That's fundamental too. First one, trust in the Lord. Second one, delight yourself in the Lord. Here's the third one. If you go to verse five, it says, commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him and he shall bring it to pass. Commit. That's the word we're focusing on. And what does commit mean? It means to remove anything that is a hindrance or a barrier and to run after God and then waddle in his presence. To remove anything that is a hindrance or a barrier. You run after God and then you like pigs when they waddle in the mud. They really enjoying that thing. They rolling on their back. Their eyes are closed. They got a real soft oint going on. When you waddle in the presence of the Lord, you're basking in his holiness. You're basking in his glory. You're running after him. You're The first thing you're doing, though, is removing anything that's a hindrance or a barrier. And this right here, brothers and sisters, this is when you have to search yourself. This is the moment of truth in these five fundamentals of faith. Removing anything that's a hindrance or a barrier. And sometimes that hindrance or that barrier can be people. When you commit your way unto the Lord, you're going to have to walk away from some relationships. You're going to have to walk away from some people. And it's difficult because sometimes the relationships we have to walk away from, the people we have to walk away from, we have known for so many years. But what are they adding to your walk with Christ? What significance do they have in your walk with Christ? Iron sharp is iron. But there's also a passage between Genesis and Revelation that say, can two walk together except they be agreed? So sometimes relationships that we have or people that's in our lives can be a hindrance or a barrier that separates us from God in the way that God wants the connection. Now, let me tell you why I say it can be difficult. Because in most cases, that hindrance or that barrier when it comes to people is a family member. And we try not to walk away from family. We try to keep that family connection close knit. But let me say this to you and let me say it with all sincereness and honesty. Everybody in your family is not for you. Everybody in your natural family is not for you. And you're trying to hold on to something that God has been trying to separate you from for so long a time because he has so much more for you. But you are allowing the foolishness that's going on with this family member or family members. You're allowing this to become a barrier because when God wants your attention, you're focused on the argument, the misunderstanding, the, the falling out from these family members. And you have to remove them. For every family member naturally that God removes from your life, he will replace it with somebody in your spiritual family. Somebody that strives for the same thing you do, that wants the same thing you do, that wants to see you prosper in the Lord. So you have to remove that barrier. What is that thing that you're still doing 
that God has been convicting you on for so many years, but you're still doing it? What is that thing that God has been asking you to do, but you have not done it? What time do he wake you up in the morning and ask you to get up and pray? That hindrance and that barrier is laziness. That hindrance and barrier is procrastination. How many times has God told you to go say something to your boss or your supervisor or this person or that person to make peace, even though you know you're not the one who did something wrong? But because you know you're not the one who did something wrong, you don't want to go and do what God told you to do. That hindrance and barrier is selfishness, is disobedience. We have to remove all of that. We have to trust God, delight in God, and commit our way. Which means anything, Lord, that's not allowing me to hear you, receive you properly, help me to move it out of the way. So that in your presence, I can just bask and wallow. In your presence, I can just sit and feel that peace that surpasses all understanding. In your presence, Lord, I can hear your voice and receive instruction as to what you would have me to do. In your presence, you will even tell me who it is I'm supposed to walk away from. I don't tell you anything in these principles that I don't apply to myself. The sad reality, brothers and sisters, because I'm transparent with you. One thing you will never get from Elijah. You will never get this, this phony charade that nothing ever goes on in my life. You will never get this attitude that I am so superior and God has blessed me so much that I don't have problems. Oh, far from it. I'm transparent. Some people have a problem with my honesty, but that's between them and God. But when you talk about this, let me explain something to you. The majority of my natural family, I don't even know who they are. That's just being 100% honest. If you ask me to pick them out in the lineup, I couldn't tell you. And some of the ones that I'm told is my natural family, I wish wasn't. And that's as honest as I can be. But some of the people that I have met in Christ feel the void that was left from where natural family should have been. I got brothers in Christ that I would lay down my life for. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? I have brothers that have proven themselves to be brothers indeed. I have sisters that are sisters indeed. Cornelius, they call him CD. Dwight, JR, I have brothers. You understand? So what I don't have in the natural is okay. God supplies it. When I just waddle in his presence and see what he has for me. Four, go to verse seven. Verse seven says, rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way because of the man that bringeth wicked devices to pass. What part of that are we focusing on? Rest in the Lord. What does that mean? When we properly define it, it means stop. And cease from everything and tarry in silence before God. That right there is the one that's most difficult for most of us to do. Stop and cease from everything and tarry in silence before the Lord. Why is that so difficult? Because most times... When we get in front of the Lord, we're telling him what's wrong with us. We're asking for stuff. God is saying, the only thing I need you to do is be quiet. Sit in my presence and wait. Slow your mind down. Slow down your thoughts. Focus solely on me. I don't need you to say anything. I know your thoughts before you think them. The only thing I need you to do is get in front of me. Get comfortable. However you need to get comfortable. If you Listen, brothers and sisters, when you go to pray, you do not have to be on your knees. You can be laying in your bed. 
You can be standing in your shower. You can be driving in your car. You can be resting on your couch, on your love seat, in your rocking chair. But when you get before him, find some time where you don't say nothing. Don't ask for nothing. Don't pray about nothing. Just say, Lord, in your presence, I dwell. And don't say nothing. Now, I'm going to tell you something that might shock some of you. But it's the truth. We have a lot of people that call themselves brothers and sisters in Christ. We have a lot of people that say they grew up in the church and they have never heard the voice of God personally. Yeah, God talks to me through his word. God talked to me through a song. God talked to me through a video. How about God talk to you, period? We are not serving some imaginary mystical being that you have to rub a, a Bible or a lamp on the side three times and poofy pop out. We are serving our father. Fathers talk to their children. Every father don't sit down and write their child a book. Every father don't sing a song when he wants to communicate with his child. A father talks to his child. God is our father. God is alive. God is well. God talks to his children. And if you learn to be quiet and just sit in silence, it's not going to come in a thunderstorm. It's not going to come in an earthquake. It's not going to come in a flyer or in the flood. But that still, small voice will come. And I'm going to share something with you that I've shared with a couple close people in my life. Once you hear the voice of God for yourself, you no longer have any excuse. Once you hear, identify, and recognize the voice of God for yourself, Every excuse you have is out the door. But you have to learn to sit before him and just be quiet. Final one. Go all the way to verse 34. It says, wait on the Lord and keep his way and he shall exalt thee to inherit the land. When the wicked are cut off, thou shalt inherit it. Now, too many people focus on inheriting the land. That is not the primary focus of this verse. The key right there is wait on the Lord. Here's the definition of wait in this context. Strain or focus your mind in a certain direction with an attitude of expectation, looking with assurance while keeping his holy way. I'm going to say it again. Strain or focus the mind in a certain direction with an attitude of expectation, looking with insurance, for, with assurance while keeping his way. That's what it means to wait on the Lord. You are focused with all of your being on Jesus, because that's the only way. But you're focused with an expectory attitude. I already know God is going to take care of everything I've laid before him. I already know, it's already done. So now I'm waiting for the ex, I'm waiting for the manifestation of what he's already promised. But while I'm waiting, I'm still doing the things that I'm supposed to do. I'm still doing everything that God requires of me. I'm not still focused on that because it's already done. And that, brothers and sisters, is the problem a lot of us deal with is waiting for the manifestation. Listen, in heaven, all of the promises of God is yes and amen in Christ Jesus. We hear a lot of times when we pray in church and somebody is sick, we hear he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. We hear that. That's Old Testament scripture. Go to the New Testament. Hear what Peter said. It says, by his stripes, we were 
heal. Past tense. It's already done. So the only thing we're doing now is we're waiting for the expectation. We're waiting for the manifestation of what's already done. In heaven, listen, here's a key. I'm going to give you a key that's going to make life so much easier. God sees us, yes. He knows us, yes. But when God said his thoughts are higher than our thoughts and his ways are higher than our ways, you have to get to the place where you understand God sees you in your perfected situation. He deals with us in our imperfection, but when he sees us, he sees us as he's perfected us. So there is no illness in the presence of God. There is no diabetes in the presence of God. There is no back pain in the presence of God. There is no eye problems in the presence of God. God sees us perfected. So while we're here on earth dealing with these things and we're praying for our healing, understand our healing has already taken place in the presence of God. So we're asking God to send the manifestation of what's already done. When you read the model prayer, Thy will be done on earth. What's next? As it is in heaven. Father, in heaven, I'm already perfected. So let that manifestation take place right here on earth. And when we start believing God for the manifestation, when we start praying for the manifestation, because it's already done, then we're going to see a change in our life. Now, I'm not going to leave you just hanging out there. Understand something. Abraham was considered the father of faith. And God promised Abraham a whole lot. And Abraham searched for a city not made with hands, whose, whose builder, whose founder was God. Abraham searched for his promised land. Abraham waited patiently for the promises of God. And guess what? In this life, he didn't get them. Read Hebrew. Read the letter to the Hebrew. He got some things, yes. But what he really desired, he didn't get. Why? He didn't get in this world. But when he walk, goes to glory, that manifestation, that promise is there. It's his. God does not lie. If God said by his stripes we're already healed, start walking in your healing and stop confessing that sin, that, that sickness. I'm sorry. Stop confessing that pain. Stop confessing that stuff. Start walking and confessing your healing. Take God at his word. You said, by your stripes, I'm already healed. Send forth the manifestation of my healing. And until you do, I'm going to tarry. I'm going to wait on you. I'm going to trust in you. I'm going to keep on doing the things you require me to do until that manifestation takes place. Because you can't lie. When we wait on the Lord, we got to let certain things fall to the wayside. Some of the things that happen in your personal life, you got to let go. The biggest thing a lot of us have to let go is church hurt. Oh yeah, I've been there. I've seen it. I've experienced it. But when we wait on God, it goes all the way back to the third one, committing your way to the Lord, removing every burial and every hindrance. Church hurt is a barrier and a hindrance that a lot of us hold on to that still separates us from what God is trying to do in us, for us, and with us. And you say, Elijah, you act like it's easy to get past. No, I'm not acting like it's easy to get past. I've dealt with it for so long, I have become immune to it. But you know what I do? I say, Lord, I'm not trying to understand their thinking. I trust you. I'm not trying to figure out why they do what they do. I trust you. 
I always ask myself this. If God was in your church right now, whatever church you go to, if God was a member of your church right now, if he walked in your church right now every Sunday, which clique would he be a part of? Who would he be talking about? Whichever clique God would be a part of, that's the clique you should be a part of. God wouldn't be a part of a clique. So if you feel like you are a part of a clique, or if you feel like some of the people that surround themselves around you are part of a clique, you need to remove yourself from that situation. That's a hindrance. That's a barrier. Listen, because I'm going to wrap this up. God is a God of love. And the sad reality is there's not a lot of love in God's church. We pick and choose who we want to love and when we want to love them. And when we don't want to love them, then we pick and choose to talk about them. God is a God of patience. He is gentle. He is kind. He is forgiving. He is trustworthy. And if we say God lives in us, we are supposed to be displaying these same characteristics. Now, the problem is, is a lot of people in the church and a lot of them in ministry, a lot of them that's behind the pulpit that will use the pulpit to slander and tear down other people, to push their own personal agenda when they're mad. And these are the so-called leaders that we're supposed to look up to. But this might be some of the barriers that has to be removed. When you focus solely on God, when you trust God, when you commit your way unto God, God will tell you where you should be. And that includes the church home and where you shouldn't be. Who should be a part of your life and who shouldn't be a part of your life. Who God will tell you, listen, brothers and sisters, because I can't stress this point enough. God will tell you who you can trust and who you cannot trust. God will tell you who you can share your intimate hurts with and who to be quiet around. God will tell you who truly loves you. And who just giving a bunch of lip service because that's what we're supposed to say in church. Oh, brother and sister, I love you. When you wait on the Lord. When you wait on the Lord. When you sit in the presence of the Lord. Quietly. God reveals so much to you. That blows your mind. Listen. Listen. I have brothers and sisters in the church that I, I attend now. I have brothers and sisters that I, I know, and it's very few. Let me, let me clarify. It's very few that I know I can go to and I can pour out and tell anything to. No judgment. No, 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 no. Just they love me enough to listen. And they offer sound advice based on experience. But there are also people in that same church that I wouldn't tell my worst enemy secret because they can't hold water with a bucket and a sponge. Let's be honest now. We're not going to sugarcoat. Let's be honest. You have some people that look for something to run and tell in the church. You have some people that look to keep chaos going. You have some people that look because they want to get in good with who's ever in the leadership. They want to get in good with a certain clique. That's not displaying the love of God. That's not committing your way to the Lord. And one thing that I find when you walk out these fundamentals, 
Sometimes it hurts. But sometimes it needs to hurt. We used to have a saying, what doesn't kill me makes me stronger. When you deal with church hurt, sometimes you wish it would have killed you. Because if this is what it takes to get strong, I don't need to get strong. <laughs> I'm just being honest. And you're talking to a preacher's kid. But let me tell you something. I shared this with you a couple days ago, and I'll say it again for this message right here. It's too much lying in the church. You can't trust in the Lord if you're lying. You can't delight yourself in the Lord if you're lying. You can't commit your way to the Lord if you're lying. You can't rest in the Lord if you're lying, and you can't wait on the Lord if you're lying. And the biggest lie that becomes a barrier in the church is when people walk up to you and say, I love you. No, they don't. Some do. Some, most are saying it because it becomes church tradition. And it's sad. And again, I can only use myself as an example. I wouldn't dare throw anybody else's name out there. But if it's a hundred people in the church that I attend now, it might be three that I know truly love me. But I'm okay with that. Because God lets me know. And I never let them know that I know. That's not what it's about. It's not about telling everything God tells you. What God shares with you is for you. If God don't tell you to share it with somebody, keep it to yourself. But God will let you know, brothers and sisters, who loves you. God will let you know who you can talk to, who you can cry with, who you can confide in. But God will also tell you, listen. Keep your mouth shut. And that goes for some pastors. Every pastor is not a pastor of God. You have some pastors that will find out your business and you will hear your business coming from across the pool pit. Amen. They don't practice these five fundamentals of faith right here. You have some people in church that will find out your business and when they get mad at you, you're going to hear your business all the way down at the club. And you know you don't go to the club. But somebody in the church go to the club and they told your business. But that same person tell, comes to you Sunday and say, I love you. When you're walking out these fundamentals of faith, when you're resting in the Lord, ask God, who in my life is not supposed to be in my life? Who am I holding on to that you're trying to remove from my life? And finally, I'm going to say this. When you walk in love, when you trust God, when God speaks to you, listen, brothers and sisters, when God speaks to you and God tells you what his purpose for your life is, when he tells you what his calling for your life is, God will also tell you when to move, how to move, and when to do what he's called you to do. You do not allow nobody else to force you into a situation or a position to do something God has not called you to do. How do you know? You rest in the Lord and you wait for his instruction. Wait to hear his voice. If God called you to sing, you sing from your heart. You make a joyful noise. I don't care if you sound like, 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 what's the sister's name? Uh, 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 Leandria Johnson. Or I don't sound, care if you sound like a wet chicken. If God called you to sing, you sing to the glory of God. But if God did not call you to sing in that capacity, you don't allow nobody to force you to sing in that capacity. If God called you to teach, you teach to the glory of God. 
But if God did not call you to teach, don't allow nobody to force you to get up in front of people and teach. Because it goes back to what I was telling you the first time. When you start doing things that God didn't call you to do to please people, then other people become a barrier because they run around and talk about your teaching. Be who God called you to be and do what God called you to do. And you can't go wrong. So again, the five steps, the five fundamentals of faith, trust in the Lord, delight yourself in the Lord, commit your way to the Lord, rest in the Lord and wait on the Lord. Now I'm going to say this to you and I'm going to close it out. It took me a while to get to the place where I was comfortable doing these videos. But God called me to teach. God called me to teach years ago. And I've taught in so many places and I've had, I've, I've enjoyed it. I enjoy teaching because I want you to know what I know. And I want you to know more than what I know. But the purpose of my teaching is not just to instruct you, but to instruct you to the point where you can go and teach somebody else for yourself. But the thing I need you to understand about me is two things. Number one, I'm not going to operate above my measure of faith. What does that mean? It means I'm not going to try to teach you something I don't know. I am not one of those men of God who want to seem like I know everything and I know every answer because I don't. And anybody who tell you that they do, stop listening to them. They're lying. With all that God has poured in me, and for all of the years I studied this book, there is still more I don't know than what I do know. But what I know, I know. So what you know, don't allow somebody else to make you feel shame or guilty for what God has poured into you. Don't allow somebody else's insecurity or somebody else's jealousy to damper the gift that God has put in you. What God gave you to share, share. And share with joy. Not looking for recognition or a pat on the back, but doing it because you want to please God. And here's the second thing that I want you to know if you continue to listen to me. Anything that God leads me to teach you, to share with you, it's not going to be my opinion. It's not going to be my personal thought. It's not going to be what somebody else told me and meant. It's going to be God's word, rightly divided. We're going to break down the words. We're going to dissect the words. And we're going to keep it in context with the scripture. Going back to that lying. We have too many pastors lying from the pulpit. Telling people of God that the word means this, that, and the other when it does not mean that. But they want to say it means that because it benefits them or their pockets. We're going to dispute all of that with the word. There's doctrines that have been taught in the church for so long, it has become tradition and they're lies. We're going to destroy all of that with the word of God. Study to show yourself approved unto God. That word study does not mean what the preachers keep telling you it means. That word study means strive to live a life pleasing, holy, and acceptable unto God. That's what study means. In the context that God gave it. So we're going to talk about stuff like tithing. Because a lot of people still preach tithing and push tithing. And after the resurrection, tithing is not for the Christian. That's why you don't see it. When people say, well, it's in the New Testament, it's in the Gospels. Yes. Before the crucifixion and resurrection. But when the temple went away, when the offerings and sacrifices went away, tithing also because that was a part of worship. And they didn't tithe with money. Unless they were traveling to a far land and couldn't get the animal or the grain or whatever was necessary. And the tithing went into the storehouse, which was a part of the temple. But it was there to take care of the needs of not just the priests, but the sick and the poor and the widows in the land. 
It was not used as it's used by these mega preachers today to buy jets and, and mansions and all this other foolishness. And they try to tell you that it's biblical. And if you don't want that, you don't want the blessings of Abraham. Abraham didn't get the blessings that was promised to him. That's why when you get into the New Testament, you see the Lord loves a cheerful giver. Because the best thing, the most important thing about tithing was your attitude. Your intent and your attitude. That's why it now says the Lord loves a cheerful giver. You give what the Holy Spirit presses upon you from the heart to give. When it starts becoming a problem, it's not cheerfully giving. But we'll get into all that later. That's a whole other thing. I'm just letting you know that when it says sound doctrine, deliverance ministry, it means sound doctrine, rightly divided, delivered from the foolishness of tradition that's still being taught in the church today. And a lot of people are not going to like it. And a lot of people are going to be upset with Elijah. Let Brothers and sisters, I say this with love. I've had people in the church upset with me my whole life. And I'm past the point of caring. My concern is that when I go before my father, I can look my God in the eye and not be ashamed or convicted for anything I taught. My concern is that my brothers and sisters that's out here truly trying to strive to live a righteous, holy life understand what God requires of them and what man is asking of them so they can discern the difference. If I didn't love you, if I didn't have the love of God in me, I wouldn't share these things. And let me share with you, right before I sign off, just to bear witness to what I was talking to you about earlier. There's people out here right now that instead of coming on and watching with love, instead of coming on to, to want to learn and to grow, there's people that, and it's not just this channel, it's other channels, that they only come on for the sole purpose of running back to somebody else in the church and say, he said, she said, guess what? Anything I say to you, brothers and sisters, I say from the highest mountain because I can stand before God and declare everything I said. This thing is not about Elijah. This thing is about the people of God being properly fed and taught the word of God so that they can live a life pleasing to God and not get caught up in all these politics and foolishness from the money grabbers that's going on in the church today. Most people don't come to church today because all they ask for is money. But when you have a need, that same church do not want to help you with your need. Where's the love of God in that? So we're going to dig into some things. We're going to dive into some things. We're going to rightly divide this word. We're going to grow together in love and in the unity of the spirit. And I pray that something I said today touched you real fast. The five fundamentals of faith coming out of Psalms 37, verse three, trust in the Lord, meaning unwavering confidence that he's going to supply all of your needs. Verse four, delight in the Lord, meaning remove yourself completely and surrender. Become soft and pliable to allow God to bend you and mold you to what he would have you to be. Number three, verse five, commit thyself unto the Lord, which means remove anything that's a hindrance or a barrier and run after God to waddle in his presence. Number four comes out of verse seven, rest in the Lord, meaning stop and cease from everything and tarry before him in silence. And number five out of verse 34, wait on the Lord, meaning strain or focus the mind in a certain direction with an attitude of expectation, looking with insurance while keeping his way. Brothers and sisters, I truly pray that something said tonight was a blessing to you. I pray that you study it, that you dissect it for yourself. Look up the words for yourself so that you realize I'm not giving you false doctrine. We're rightly dividing the word. 
I pray that the next time we come together, that we'll have something else that will enhance your walk with God, that will allow you to grow more in the calling that he has called you to. Know that until then, I love you. I'm praying for you. I'm praying with you. Continue to walk in wisdom and grow in grace. I love you. God bless.